Hey everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Last month I was invited by the Aeroid Society Australia to do a talk about aeroids and how to grow them large in an indoor setting. Before I'm going to show you the recording, let's maybe just quickly clarify what are aeroids. So aeroids are a family of plants and very common genus like Monstera, Philodendron, Alocasia, Anthuriums, they all fall under that family. So probably 99% of the plants that I grow are in the aeroid family. And in my session, I really want to focus on climbing aeroids like the ones you can see behind me. Before I hand over to Jan from a month ago, I would like to let you know that I've created a playlist with all of my MossPol tutorials and you'll find videos that go into a little bit more depth about a lot of the topics that I'm going to touch on within the talk itself. So feel free to check it out and I'll link it on the end screen. Enjoy! A little bit about myself, I started my plant journey in 2019 and I very quickly fell in love with climbing monsteras and climbing philodendrons. And I set myself a goal to grow them into as large of a specimen as possible within an indoor setting. So, today's presentation is really all about sharing the experiences that I've made over the last three years with you in trying to grow large aeroids indoors. The presentation today is going to start uh, by talking about conditions and care. We then move on to a quick moss pole guide and at the end I'll wrap it all up and give you some pros and cons of the approach I've been taking over the last three years. So let's get started. I'd like to start off with a quote from one of my plant friends Daryl Cheng. Make sure to give him a follow on social media, he's a wealth of knowledge. He says that light dictates the growth potential of your plant and care realizes that potential. Now, that's a quote that really resonated with me, but I'd actually like to expand on that a little bit. While I agree that light is the most important out of all of the conditions, I would like to expand and actually talk a little bit about the difference between conditions and care. So when we're talking about conditions, we need to consider that different species grow in different conditions in nature. So to bring out the best in our plants and to get them to mature and grow as large and beautiful as possible, we should aim to match the growing conditions in our environment as closely as possible to the plant's natural habitat. That means you have one of two choices in an indoor setting. You really need to assess your conditions first and you can then choose plants that suit your conditions or you can try and supplement the conditions that you have to suit the plants that you want to grow. What do I mean by growing conditions? First of all, I'm talking about light and it is the most important. So I'm going to single it out on the next slide again. I'm talking about temperature. I personally try and keep the temperature at above 16 degrees at all times. Most of the plants that I grow are tropical plants and appreciate more warmer temperatures. That doesn't mean that a plant can't survive in anything below 16 degrees Celsius, but I don't want them to do just survive. I want them to thrive, I want them to mature, so I want to give them optimal conditions. Humidity is probably the hardest one to achieve, and I have to admit I'm pretty lucky with the location that I'm in. I personally have around 60% humidity um, on average without having to supplement. Always consider the plants you're trying to grow. Not all plants need a high humidity environment, but um, rule of thumb, or from my personal experience, you can't really go wrong with around 60% humidity. And the last one, and probably the most underrated out of them all, and really important, especially where we have a humid, warm environment, is airflow. We want to make sure that we can prevent any mold or fungal issues on our plants, but also within our apartment. So airflow is super important, and you can achieve that by just opening a window or getting a fan uh, to just make sure there's constant airflow. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about light because as I said earlier, I do believe that light is the most important out of all of the conditions. Light changes throughout the day, but light also changes throughout the year. So what that really means is that you can't judge the light levels a plant gets in a specific spot based on one day's worth of observations. So if you're trying to find the perfect spot for your plant, 
you might need to look at it over a period of time and you need to reassess all the time. I personally rearrange my, uh, my living room probably every couple of weeks, uh, not necessarily just because of the light, also because I like it. Um, but ultimately the sun changes all the time and a spot that you found to be perfect for a specific plant might not be so perfect uh, after the sun has moved. So keep that in mind, but if you do find a spot and your plant is thriving, you don't necessarily need to fix what's not broken. Definitely make sure to consider each plant's light requirements. Not all plants require the same amount of light to mature. But rule of thumb would be that if you want your plant to mature, you need to grow them as close to the natural conditions as possible. In nature, these climbing aeroids would climb up a tree and as they climb up the tree and get closer to the canopy, they get access to more light. And that's really what's triggering them to mature. So if you want your plants to mature and grow large, grow large leaves, you will have to give them sufficient light to actually get there. So that is the most important out of all of the conditions. There's not much you can do to make your plants grow really nice and large if you do not provide it with sufficient light. Now, also consider if you even want your plant to mature. Um, there are some plants that I much prefer the juvenile form of. For example, I prefer syngoniums when they're juvenile. I don't really want to see them mature. So I purposely give them less light than they probably would want. Uh, so I keep them nice and small. Ultimately, you will end up having way more plants than you probably have good spots to grow them in. So you do need to prioritize which are the plants that you really want to see mature. Which plants do you want to see go through this transformation from juvenile to mature specimen? Now, when it comes to assessing light levels, you could use a light meter. Make sure to take multiple readings and take an average. As I said, light levels change all the time. I personally take a less sophisticated approach and I'll just observe my plants and let the plants tell me the story. Of course, each species is different, but usually if a plant is getting sufficient light levels, you will see that the leaves are continuously getting bigger as they grow and you will see that the space between two nodes is usually pretty small, also referred to as the internodal spacing. If you have plants who produce smaller leaves and plants that have very large internodal spacing, it's probably a sign that your plant is looking for more light. So I would change it around and look if a different spot works better for the plant. Ultimately, nothing beats trial and error in my opinion and that's the way that I've been taking and that's the approach that I've been taking over the last three years. So before I move on to care, really to wrap up, conditions are predetermined by the plant's DNA. So we don't really have any um, way of manipulating the conditions that a plant might like. But what we can do is we can manipulate the conditions that we are growing the plant in. The closer we can get our conditions to the natural conditions the plant is used to, then the, the more likely we're going to get our plant to maturity and get those really nice, large, beautiful leaves. But if your conditions are not right, then you can really care for your plants as much as you want. You won't really be able to compensate for it. So that's something I get asked a lot. People send me photos of their plants and they're saying that the plant isn't really growing the way that they like it. What have they done wrong? And it's not necessarily always something that uh, you do wrong as part of your care. If you have a plant that grows in conditions that just doesn't suit the plant, you can care for it as much as you want. You can do everything 100% correct. You're not really going to be able to compensate for it in the long run. So get your conditions right first or get the plants for the right conditions that you've got. And then we can move on to care. And that's really where the magic happens. Now, when we talk about care, there isn't just one approach to plant care, which is great. So there's so many different ways of achieving similar or the same results. Today, I'm really just going to talk to you about the approach that I've been taking, which is um, moss pots. Again, with care, also do trial and error and find out what works for you and your plants in your environment. So what do I refer to when I say the care requirements of a plant or the care that we can give to our plant? I'm talking about the growing medium and the repotting frequency. I'm talking about the fertilizer or nutrients that we can feed our plants. 
I'm talking about the growing method. So are we letting it grow up? Are we letting it trail and so on? And I'm talking about the watering and the watering frequency. So I'm going to address all of these care requirements by going through a bit of a moss pole guide. So let's talk about moss poles. Happy days. I want to take you on a little journey of my Monstera Dubia. So in this photo, you can see my Monstera Dubia as I got it in September 2019. as just a small little unrooted two leaf cutting. I didn't pop it on a moss pole straight away. I just had it root on moss, on moss first. But as soon as I saw a few little roots sticking out the back, I took it and I put it on a moss pole. Uh, and you can see over here the bottom two leaves on this moss pole are those two leaves that um, I initially got. Once I popped it on a moss pole, the plant will attach itself to the moss pole using its root, roots and it will then start climbing up that moss pole. Straight away, I know that this plant is getting sufficient light as each leaf is getting larger and the internodal spacing is quite short. It's actually so short that the leaves are overlapping. So the plant is telling me that it's getting enough light and it's getting a really good opportunity to actually mature. Now, let's talk about the moss pole um, itself a little bit more. Um, I construct all of my moss poles myself and I just make them out of a, a coated wire mesh. Really important that it's coated wire and not plastic because we want to make sure that the pole has structural integrity. My poles can actually stand up all by themselves without even be potted up. All of my poles are 90 centimeters. It's pretty much just because that's the size the mesh comes in, but it actually works really handy when we're talking about moss pole extensions in a second. I very often get asked how much moss do you put in a moss pole? Um, and it's a little bit hard to quantify, but I would say a six out of 10. So don't make it too dense. If it's too dense, your moss pole is not really gonna drain properly and it's gonna get really heavy and you're running risk that your moss pole is just falling over. If it's too light, then um, if there's not enough moss inside the moss pole, then there just isn't enough moss to actually retain moisture, uh, which will make your life really, really tricky in trying to keep it moist. But we're talking about watering in a little bit later anyway. Now, usually I construct my moss poles to be round because a, um, a cylinder is just the most, uh, the, the strongest shape of them all. Um, but in this instance, because Monstera dubia in juvenile form is a shingling plant, I just constructed a moss pole as normal, but I just flattened out one side. So this is why this moss pole looks slightly different than any of the other ones you might see on my social media. Alrighty, so I'll just continuously keep the moss pole moist to make sure that the plant has enough water and nutrients to um, you know, climb up and mature and give it the best opportunity to give me these big leaves. But eventually the plant will reach the top of the moss pole, so it's time to extend it. So on the left over here, you can see that I just put another 90 centimeter on, pole on top, which puts that plant at a height of 180 centimeters now. Of course, the plant will eventually reach the top of that extension as well. And that's when I need to chop it in half. So when I chop it in half, I really just mean that I separate the top extension that I put on before and the bottom half of the pole. Um, in this photo on the right, you can now see that I've got the bottom half as it is and the top half, the part that has the more mature leaves, that's the one that I want to keep using and that's, one, that's the one I want to keep working with to continue to see it to maturity. Now, normally if you take a top cutting this large, that would be unrooted, it would be very, very uh, stressful for the plant and the plant is probably gonna abort a few leaves um, in favor of surviving and putting all of that energy into building a root system. However, because this plant has been growing on the moss pole and every single node of this plant has already rooted into the moss pole, this top half actually has a very large root system available within the pole to eliminate or at least reduce any sort of shock from this um, any sort of shock from this chop. So I can take this top cutting and pot it up straight away. So we end up with something like this. I then take that top cutting and put another 90 centimeter pole on top. You could do the same with the bottom half. The bottom half will also reshoot. It's quite likely that it might actually reshoot in multiple um, spots. 
um, or you could just chop it up into single node cuttings. As I said, every single node is already rooted into the pole, so it's basically 100% propagation success if you would like to chop this into single node cuttings. Now, that top half is then going to continue to grow and eventually it's going to reach the top of the pole again. Now, if we're looking at that photo on the right, you could be really critical and you could say that after the chop, there might be one or two leaves right in the middle of this picture that are slightly smaller. But if we're looking at the fenestration, it's actually still showing very continuous progress towards maturity. So I would say that the chop really didn't impact this plant whatsoever, or if anything, it was very, very minimal. All right. And all we do is now just repeat the same again. We're going to chop the top part off. We're going to pot it back up and we're going to re-extend it. We're letting it grow. Then we're chopping it in half. We're potting up the top half and we're re-extending it. So, using the chop and extend method, I was able to grow my Monsteria dubia from a small juvenile plant to quite a large mature specimen in less than two years by always taking the top part of the pole, potting it back up and re-extending it, making sure the pole never exceeds a height of 180 centimeters, so it's manageable at all times. Let's talk a little bit more about the growing medium that I put these moss poles in. So I construct my own aeroid mix and when we're talking about the mix, I just really want to make sure that it's as chunky and as light as possible. That way I can ensure that it's well aerated and well draining. When we're talking about watering the moss pole in the following slides, you'll notice that we need to water the moss pole itself more frequently than you would ever water the actual potting medium itself. That way we're running risk of overwatering. Overwatering isn't really a thing in itself. Overwatering is usually, or root rot isn't usually caused by overwatering. It's caused by a lack of oxygen that is available to those roots. So you just want to make sure that it's super chunk and light so that you have a lot of air bubbles in your mix. So there's sufficient oxygen for um, the roots uh, not to rot. So how do I achieve a chunky, light and well aerated mix? I use a lot of bark, I use a lot of coca chips, I use a lot of perlite and pumice, and I always use the most chunky of them all. But I do add a little bit of coca peat, charcoal, sand and vermiculite just to have a little bit of extra uh, chunkiness, but also some uh, water, reten water and nutrient retention. Now there's a lot of different ways to get a nice aeroid mix. By no means am I saying this is the aeroid mix that you have to use, but just keep in mind that whatever you use, you want it to be chunky and light so that you have a lot of aer aeration and drainage. All right, I spoke to you about doing the chop and extend and then just repeating it again and again. So I prepared a little tutorial over here that I'm just gonna talk over while it's playing. So over here you can see that uh, that was the last time I chopped my dubia and I really just separate the two poles that I previously extended by chopping the cable ties that were holding it together and it just comes off like that. You can see that there's some really chunky roots already sticking out and I can't wait to get them inside the pot so they can expand. I do remove as much moss as possible from the bottom of the pole and replace it with the aeroid mix. I put it in a pot and um, I'll then just top it up with the aeroid mix as per the previous slide. I use a garden stake to hold everything together. So I cable tie the first pole to the garden stake and then I just take a new extension and I cable tie that extension to the garden stake as well. And that's really as easy as it is. Um, I've take, done these chop and extends. Um, over a dozen times now and I've had nothing but success. I've gotten really fast and good at them. I can do them in about 10 minutes by myself now. But if you're attempting this for the very first time, I definitely recommend that you get somebody else to help you out, especially if you start having very large specimen with huge leaves. In a perfect world, we wouldn't really ever have to chop our plants. Look, I mean, nobody goes around in nature through the rainforest and chops the plants to get them to maturity. They do that all by themselves. But when we're talking about growing them in an indoor setting, it's just unrealistic to have a moss pole that's about four meters tall. So this chop and extend method really makes sure that the plant remains manageable. My, my pole never gets over 180 centimeters in height, which is a great height if you ever want to fit your plant through 
a door frame to maybe put it in a bathtub to give it a thorough watering or some uh, sp spraying it for pests and so on. So it's maintaining that manageability of the actual pole while still giving the plant the best opportunity to continue to mature because we're using the most mature part of the plant at all times and it is rooted at all times as well. Rule of thumb, if you want this to be successful, is try and have as many roots as possible within the moss pole itself. So you want to make sure that every single node attaches itself to the pole. That's easily achieved by just starting your moss pole with a small cutting. If you take an already mature plant and you put it on a moss pole, old nodes are very unlikely to actually root into the moss pole in hindsight. So I always start my moss poles with a small cutting and then let it grow up the moss pole all by itself so I can ensure that every single node is thoroughly rooted into the moss pole, giving me the best chances of success. But be realistic with your expectations. Uh, every time you chop a plant, there is some level of shock. So uh, just trust the process and don't be discouraged if the very first leaf after you chopped it is maybe a little bit smaller, has less fenestration or is a little bit deformed. After all, you chopped it halfway through its development. The added bonus is you will end up with the bottom half of that moss pole and that bottom half still has a lot of leaves and a lot of roots available. So it has a lot of energy and nowhere to go with it. So it's gonna reshoot and if you're lucky it might reshoot in multiple spots. Alrighty, now I said that the secret to success for this method is having a large root system contained within the moss pole. And that large root system within the moss pole is also the reason why I use very small pots. All of my pots are usually only around 20 centimeters. Um, it's not, it doesn't really need a larger pot because the root system is really within the pole. The pot is just mainly giving it stability, but of course the roots from within the pole will expand into the pot eventually as well. But what that means is that really I need to maintain the moss pole. When it comes to watering, when it comes to fertilizing, I need to make sure that I'm making the root system within the moss pole happy. So I need to make sure that the moss pole stays moist at all times, or if it dries out, it doesn't dry out completely at least. So how do I water it? Let's have a look at this little video. All I really do is I take a water bottle, I put a few holes in the lid of it, I put in water and fertilizer, and I pop it upside down and I'll let gravity do the rest. Now the gravity um, is going to make all of the water drain through and eventually it might also reach the pot and it might actually drain out of the pot as well. So all of my plants on poles are in nursery pots and then I put the nursery pot inside a planter. So if there's any excess water I can just very easily empty out the planter so that the pot in itself is not actually sitting in any water. But over the years I've also learned exactly how much water each pole can take. So if I've let's say for example only the top half is empty then I know to only water maybe half a liter or so. So the water won't actually drain all the way through so I'm not overwatering the bottom part of the pole and or the pot in itself. So watering is definitely one of the largest challenges when it comes to maintaining your moss pole and due to the large surface area the moss pole in itself just dries out so much quicker than the substrate in itself would. That's why you will find yourself uh, pouring water down the moss pole quite frequently. If it's a really dry week I might do that every two or three days in winter um, or if it's if it's a colder more humid week then it might just be once a week. But I only ever water the moss pole, I don't actually ever water the pot in itself. You'll also notice that the top of the pole dries out quicker. As I said, you can also just water the top by just pouring down less water. What you can also do is you can construct your moss pole um, so that it retains more moisture in the first place. You can achieve that by having a plastic backing on the moss pole, which just reduces the surface level, uh, surface area and hence the water um, evaporation. And you can just construct the moss pole so it maintains more, mo more moss. Moss is what really retains the moisture. So if you have too little moss in your pole because it may be too skinny or you didn't pack it densely enough, then the pole will of course dry out much quicker. Also, don't bother misting your moss pole. You're really just going to literally scratch the surface of the moss pole and it's going to evaporate super, super quickly. When I water my moss pole, I always water it thoroughly, so all of it is moist, even the inside of the pole, because that's really where the root system is. 
As I said before, make sure that the substrate in itself is very chunky and well draining so that uh, there's no worry about potential root rot and consider that different species have different watering requirements. So Monsteras, for example, would be more tolerant to drying out. So apply the same principle that you usually do to your potting medium, where you say, yep, the surface can dry out a little bit. Apply the same to your moss pole. Really see the moss pole as an extension of your potting medium. See the moss in itself as a growing medium and treat it exactly like you would normally treat your potting medium. Again. So we spoke about conditions first. And really the one thing about conditions we need to remember is that we are not in charge. The conditions are predetermined by the plant's DNA and all we can do is try and match the conditions as closely as possible. Once we've got the conditions right, then we can start caring about the plant in hopefully the best way possible to give it optimal chances of maturing and giving us those large beautiful leaves. But conditions really always need to come first and then we can look at our care approach. Now, my care approach is moss poles, and here are some pros and cons of the approach that I've been taking. Now, pros, moss poles encourage root growth. Every single node is going to root into the pole if you keep the pole nice and moist, as roots will always look for moisture. The more roots, the more potential, and potential is really what we need when we want to see our plants mature. Growing plants vertically is also super space efficient. Right? So I live in an apartment and space is precious. Every horizontal surface is already filled with plants. So the only way to go is go up. So growing these large aeroids on um, moss poles really just reduces them still down to a surface area of just a 20 centimeter pot. But I can really make a big impact uh, in, in my apartment with these statement pieces. Growing them up a moss pole is also as close as possible to the natural growing conditions that these plants are, or the natural growing pattern that these plants show in nature, climbing up trees. The moss pole and all of the root system contained within the moss pole really reduces the shock when taking any cuttings. And really, growing something on a moss pole is basically like air layering your plant while growing it without having to use any of the ugly cling film. So moss pole is a great way of propagating plants. And probably my favorite part of the moss poles at all, um, I said before that my environment is around about 60% humidity without actually having to use a humidifier. Now, of course, I'm quite lucky living in Sydney and it's usually quite humid, but we do also have dry weeks. Um, but I do believe that actually the humidity that my moss poles give up, as I said before, moss has a very large surface area and water evaporates quite quickly. Like where, do, where does all of that water go? Well, it goes into the humidity of our, of our apartment or of our environment. So these moss poles, especially because I have so many of them by now, really give me a good humidity boost indoors. Now, I want to be critical about my moss pole approach as well, but I'm heavily biased, so the list isn't quite as large as the pros. There's maintenance work. You need to ensure to water them and um, you know, ma maintain them. You need to make them, you need to chop and extend them and so on. Uh, but whenever there's plants, there is usually some maintenance work involved with it as well. And that's really what I consider my hobby. I love doing these sort of things um, and watch my plant thrive. You will require materials, but I keep my moss poles really simple. I just use a coated wire mesh and moss. I don't do any fancy self-watering techniques and so on. So I really just need moss, um, the wire mesh, and I use cable ties to hold it all together. And of course, once they get to maturity and they get to 180 centimeters tall, they can be quite tricky to move. But really, you can take the principle of chopping and extending your moss pole to any sort of moss pole height. I just happen to use 90 centimeter poles. So the tallest I go is 180, which works quite well for, uh, for me. But if you feel like that's too tall, you can totally apply the same principle to just smaller moss poles and um, hopefully have success in growing your plants to maturity. If you've gotten that far, thank you so much for listening to the whole thing. And I really hope you enjoyed it and got some value out of it that you can take and incorporate into your own plant journey. Feel free to subscribe or follow me on Instagram or TikTok. And I hope I see you soon. Bye.